All right, we'll get going here again. Uh, one of the things that I'm really thankful for, can you hear me good? No problem? Okay. Uh, that I'm really thankful for is how the speakers mesh that we get. And uh, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like we're getting a lot of different areas of information. There's not a lot of overlap. And uh, that's really good. And they complement each other well. And um, uh, so I'm going to get out of the way. We're running a little bit late again, but I'm going to bring Jay up to speak. Yeah. I think you probably control it in the back. Well, good evening. I don't know if you remember me or not. I'm the person who spoke just after lunch, and now I'm speaking just after dinner. So <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. It could be a compliment or just a challenge. But so. I will try to stay awake and you try to stay awake too. Well, another interesting topic, uh, this changes everything, the flood of Noah. Uh, in a sense, we're gonna be talking about the flood of Noah, but we're not gonna talk about the flood of Noah. <laughs> what does that mean? Yes, we will talk about the flood, but the point of this talk is not just to give you all the facts. And when did it occur, how did it occur, and all these you know, scientific details, that's not the point. The point is, again, that we can trust the Bible from cover to cover in everything that it says. Uh, this is a Bible and prophecy conference, We're talking a fair amount about prophecy. This is actually going to tie into prophecy, believe it or not. Again, as has been mentioned a few times, if we can't trust what God tells us about the beginning of everything, how can we trust anything else, including the return of Christ? And a lot of Christians end up picking and choosing what they believe, and when they do that, they really become the ultimate source of authority, determining what they're going to buy into and what they're not going to buy into, what they're going to believe, what they're not going to believe, what they like, what they don't like, rather than just saying, you know what, this is God's word. I'm going to accept it from cover to cover, whether I understand it all or not, whether I like it or not. Um, and so this approach here, we need to use when we're looking at the flood, because a lot of people struggle with the story of the flood. I hate to even call it a story because it sounds like something mythical. It's the account of the flood. But we're going to tie this into prophecy as well. And this would be you guys. I am using you as guinea pigs because I haven't really given this presentation before. Maybe something a little bit similar, but I'm working on putting together a three volume series on the flood called This Changes Everything, you know, the, the flood of Noah. Uh, one part will be a description of the flood, the significance of it. The second one will be physical scientific evidence that there really was a worldwide flood. And the third one will probably be modern day examples of catastrophic events that did a lot of damage in a very short period of time. So, but before I get to that you know, new series, I'm putting together little portions here. So I'm just testing this out. I don't know how long this talk takes. It doesn't take too long. I won't be going over. We might you know, finish a little bit early. Uh, but again, the important point here is that we can trust God's word from cover to cover. And as I was thinking about this, something hit me, an analogy. I, I think through things fairly logically with my background. And how many of you are familiar with Moses and the burning bush? Probably most of you, you know. The Hebrews were in captivity in Egypt, and God calls Moses and say, hey, Moses, you know, I want you to go back to Egypt, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. We're, we're familiar with that point in history. But here's what I was thinking about. Moses is in the wilderness, and he sees this burning bush, and God starts talking to him. Can you imagine how you would respond if all of a sudden you saw a bush burning, but it's not being burned up, and God is speaking to you? It would really grab your attention, wouldn't it? Well, and it worked for Moses. Moses is really laser focused on what God was saying. So I was thinking about that. And I thought, what if it wasn't a burning bush? What if it was a burning tree? And I thought, well, it wouldn't make any difference. No difference whatsoever. It's a tree burning instead of a bush. It's still God speaking. It really grabbed your attention. Okay, what if it wasn't a bush or a tree, but it was a burning cactus? Again, same thing. It just doesn't matter. God is speaking here. We really need to listen. Well, what if it wasn't a bush, a tree, or cactus? What if it was a giant emu that was on fire? Again, kind of humorous, but again, it just doesn't matter. God is saying something, and you take it seriously. Okay, here's the final point. What if it wasn't a burning bush, or a tree, or a cactus, or even an emu? 
What if God chose to write some things down in a book? Oh, well, that's just the Bible. Why do we kind of respond that way? Well, it's just the Bible. I mean, how is that any different than God speaking through a burning bush? It's still God saying something. It's just as true. But we don't take it as seriously. We just kind of put it on the shelf and Sunday comes up. Hey, where did where'd my Bible go? Oh, yeah, grab it and go to church, listen to a sermon, go home, and maybe put it away. You know, too many, too many of us do that too often because we don't really see it as what it is. This is the word of God to us, but we'd like something flashy and then it might get our attention. God says, no, just trust me, this, this is my word. So we need to take seriously everything that God says about the creation account, about the flood, about Jesus, and about end time events. They all should be taken just as seriously because they're all found in the word of God. Well, today, in this country and around the world, we have basically lost our moral compass. Things have always been getting worse, but I think it's starting to go exponential. I think the wheels are starting to fall off. It's really, really getting worse a lot faster than normal. In fact, I think Facebook today recognizes 58 different options for gender. Isn't that, I mean, just insane? But as I travel around, I ask people, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having 58 options for gender? My answer is nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless there is a standard against which everything is measured. Then you could say that that's wrong. But too often Christians put this aside. The topic comes up of transgenderism or same-sex marriage or abortion or whatever it might be. And the Christian might say something about the Bible, and the skeptic says, oh, you can't bring that up. That's the Bible. That's religion. You've got to leave that out. And the Christian says, well, okay. And then they try to argue their case apart from the authority of God's word. You've just lost. You've just lost the game as soon as you put the Bible aside. They say, you can't bring the Bible into this. If you think about this, again, logically speaking, you're giving up your starting point, your worldview, and trying to argue apart from that. They're not giving up their starting point. Your belief is that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and you argue from there. Their belief is that the Bible is not the inspired word of God, and they're keeping that. You're not making them give up their starting point, so they get to keep theirs, but you're giving yours up without a fight, and now you're just done, so we should never give that up. It's our basis for making a judgment on something. Anytime someone says, well, I think these two guys should be able to get married, I always ask, what did you just turn to right now as a source of authority to determine that it would be okay for these two guys to get married? What, what tells you that it's actually okay? Well, I just think they have the right. Oh, so you just think that that's your opinion. Yeah. Well, why should the whole world bow to what your opinion is versus someone else's that might be different? You know, and do we take a vote? Do we do it country by country? Do we do it state by state or, or county by county or city by city? And then how often do we vote? Because people change their minds. And you can keep mining that question deeper and deeper, and they realize there's no absolute authority there whatsoever for them to be making these claims. But as a Christian, we could say, the reason I think this is wrong is because God says it's wrong. It's not just my philosophy. If you have a problem with what I'm saying, it's not really with me. It's with what God's word says. So this is a huge issue for us as Christians that we too often give up our source of authority and try to argue from a different angle, which means that we've lost right away. And tying this into prophecy, Jesus talked about the end times, Matthew 24, 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This was referred to, I think Tim mentioned this when he was talking. So Jesus says that the end times are going to be kind of like it was when Noah was around. Okay, well, we're going to be talking about the flood of Noah's time, so let's take a look at what it says. Genesis 6, 5 through 8. I'm going to read through the lengthy passage, and then we're going to go back and look at certain portions. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So again, we're familiar with that scenario. Things had gotten so bad. This is roughly 1,600, 1,700 years 
after creation. Everything was perfect. Adam and Eve sinned. That messed everything up. And it got so bad, God's kind of like, you know what? I'm kind of sorry that I even created them. I'm going to send a flood to judge the entire planet. But God spared Noah and his wife and three sons and their three wives because of their willingness to do that. Anyone else could have come on the ark, but they didn't want to. So we're familiar with that backdrop. We also have in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, Peter, writing almost 2,000 years ago, is also talking about the last days. He's specifically talking about skeptics, people who doubt the return of Christ. I'm going to read through this passage, and then we will go back and look at a few, a few verses one at a time here. He said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. This is something they already heard. He's reminding them of this. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, of the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of, the, of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So Peter's talking about our time, the last days, skeptic scoffers who are doubting the return of Christ. We're going to go back now and take a look at just a few of these passages here, starting in verse 3. It says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So first Peter is saying that these skeptics are following their own evil desires. They're being led away by their own lust and their own sinful nature. And they're saying, Where is the return of Christ? You guys said he's coming back. He hasn't come back. He's not here now. In fact, he's never coming back. In fact, everything continues on the way it always has from the beginning of the universe up until now. No major events going on there. Everything's just continuing the way it always has smoothly from the beginning of this world. That's what the skeptics are saying at this point. I'm going to give you a very, very quick history lesson that ties into what Peter wrote almost 2,000 years ago. We have a timeline here, 1700s, 1800s, 1900. Darwin's on the uh, right side over there. Just prior to Darwin, which we're somewhat familiar with Darwin there, writing The Origin of Species, tied in with the idea of evolution. Just before Darwin, two guys came in on the scene. When one, the first guy, James Hutton, died, Charles Lyell, the second guy was born, so they lived back to back. James Hutton came on the scene and basically said, you know what? This world we're living in wasn't shaped by like a global flood or anything. It's just natural processes that we observe today. Just natural processes are the thing that accounts for why we're seeing all of these features. In fact, here's what he said. He's a father of modern geology. So the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the, glo <coughs> natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those which we know the principle. This is something called uniformitarianism. Big long word. All it means is uniform, the same. Just the same slope, gradual processes that we see today. We see wind blowing and rain and things like that. Some maybe some sand being accumulated somewhere. Just those slow, gradual processes that we observe today, we can only refer to those in explaining the mountains and the valleys and the canyons and all that. If that were true, that would take a long, long time. That would take millions of years to form all these layers that we see in the Earth. This conclusion was not a scientific conclusion. It was a philosophical decision to rule out anything supernatural and just decide, you know what? We're only going to accept natural explanations to explain this world around us. So for, forget God and all the supernatural things. It's just natural forces. Again, if that were true, that would take a long time. So the belief that was largely held at that point that the earth was relatively young, created by God and judged by a flood, that was being abandoned because now they discovered millions and millions of years of earth history. 
When he died, Charles Lyell was born, and he, was also, he also became a geologist. Charles Lyell, he wrote the three principles of geology, three volume series principles of geology, and his goal was to free the science from Moses. Okay, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, talked about creation and the flood. It was his goal to separate science from that, from the revelation of God through Moses. Just use a natural explanation. So again, he was piggybacking on what James Hutton said and the newly found millions and millions of years. And what's sad is at that time in history, just prior to Darwin kind of coming on the scene, at the time you had Christians who were living, some were scientists, some were theologians, some were both. In fact, almost every major area of science we have was founded by a Bible-believing Christian. It's part of a whole other talk that I give. So you had people living at, back at this time that were scientists and theologians. The scientists back then looked at the work that these guys were bringing up and said, this is not good science. You don't have to worry about what they're saying. You could ignore it. But many of the theologians said, well, if they've discovered evidence of millions and millions of years, we're going to have to fit that into the Bible somehow. Maybe there's a different way of looking at Genesis. Maybe those weren't regular days of creation. So they came up with different ideas, the day-age theory, that each day of creation was actually millions and millions and millions of years. So yes, God created in six days, but they weren't regular days. So you can still have billions of years over the history of the universe and still say that you believe in the six-day creation because they're not regular days. Other people looked at the text and said, you just can't stretch the days out. The Hebrew is so clear, though. Those are regular days. But they were still wanting to believe what these geologists were saying. So they came up also with the gap theory. Thomas Chalmers talked about the gap theory, that there's a gap between Genesis 1.1 and 1.2. I won't go into the, the details of all that, but they tried to stick millions and millions and millions and millions of years in a gap. And after the millions of years that went by of the Earth history where the, the canyons are forming, the mountains and all that, the Earth is very, very, very old, then God starts recreating everything in six literal days. So now you squeeze all the time in a gap there. So they worked so hard to try to fit the newly found millions and millions of years into scripture somehow. I think most of them were being very sincere in trying to do that, but they did injustice to scripture in doing so. So now that's the backdrop. With that, Charles Darwin, who was trained as a theologian, became kind of angry towards God. One reason is he lost a daughter at a very young age, became bitter towards God didn't really want anything to do with God anymore. He took Charles Lyell's three uh, series volume on principles of geology on the Beagle, on his trip that he went on. And he thought if these guys could explain the natural features of the earth through these newly found millions and millions of years, maybe he, Darwin, could explain the variety of life through these newly found millions of years apart from God's supernatural act. And so he ends up writing The Origin of Species, trying to explain everything apart from God. And we've had it ever since, and it's crept into the church. And now it's in many Christian seminaries and many, many Christian colleges. Most Christian colleges do not teach six-day creation account anymore. They teach variations of that. It's very sad. It's part of a whole other talk that I give. But this is what's happened in history. And there were a lot of other things going on at that time period. That's where we got Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. There were a lot of spiritual things, spiritually dark things going on at that time largely when Christians maybe were dropping the ball and not taking a stance on the authority of God's word. That's just a little bit of history there. I already mentioned Darwin, how he took all that and then got that into the school system. Um, he said it's not fair that we're only teaching one view. You can't just teach one view. For most of our history in our country, we were teaching creation and using the Bible in the school system, using it for grammar and morality and history and all that. It's not fair to only teach one view. So what are we doing today? We're only teaching one view. <laughs> but now the Bible's out and evolution is in. So again, part of a whole nother talk, but that's historically how things have kind of changed over time. Back to what Peter was saying. Peter is saying these skeptics who are denying the return of Christ, they're willingly ignorant of two things. They're choosing to ignore two things, okay? Now, they're denying the return of Christ. That's a spiritual thing, right? Definitely. So. The two things that are causing them to deny that, they, they must be spiritual things too, right? That's not what Peter says. First time I, this hit me years ago, it just stunned me as to what these two things were. And it's incredibly significant and it's incredibly prophetic. Again, this is 2,000 years ago, Peter is saying this. 
here are the two things. Number one, he says, They are willing and ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. This is the original creation account. Peter is saying, number one, these skeptics are denying the original creation account. They don't accept the Genesis creation account. Number two, he goes on to say, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now Peter brings up the flood. These are the two things that are causing skeptics to deny the return of Christ. They reject the Genesis creation account and they reject the Genesis flood. Every single secular scientist rejects the Genesis creation account and they reject the Genesis flood. No question there. Peter predicted that. But what's sad is that many Christians reject the Genesis creation account and the flood. Oh, they'll say, yes, God's the creator, but it didn't happen the way Genesis says. Those weren't regular days. God didn't really do it that way. He used the Big Bang. Maybe he used you know, evolution and the flood. No, that didn't really happen. It, they either reject it outright, it didn't happen at all, it's just a story, or they'll say, well, it was just kind of a local flood. They write it off, they do not accept that. Peter predicted that 2,000 years ago, and it's again crept into the church because it has everything to do with the authority of God's word. They're trusting man's wisdom over God's wisdom. And this is what's happening, and it's causing many youth to walk away from their faith because they're told, well, yes, it says that God created in six days, but it doesn't really mean that. Well, yes, it says there was a flood, but it doesn't really mean that. Well, then why accept the Jesus stuff? I talked to one guy at a Bible study. They asked me to come to this Bible study because they were going through Genesis. And they were up to the point of the flood, and they said, there's one guy in our group who's just given us a hard time all the way through. He totally is rejecting all these things. They said, could you just pop in? We know you travel all the time, but you know, if you're home some weekend, could you come over? So one Saturday morning, I went and sat in, and I just shared a few things, and then we did Q&A. And as soon as we did Q&A, I could tell which guy was the skeptic. He was upset. He just went off. He totally rejected the creation account. He goes, scientists have proven the Big Bang. We know that's a fact, and evolution's a fact. Genesis creation account didn't happen that way, and there wasn't a flood. No geologist accepts that. And I just said, well, if scientists have proven anything, they have proven that people don't come back from the dead. Maybe after 30 seconds or two minutes, but not after three days. He looked at me and he said, well, now you're being sarcastic. I said, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to offend you. I am not trying to be sarcastic. I am using your logic. You say that scientists have discovered certain things, so therefore the Bible can't mean what it says. Well, I agree. Scientists have shown that people don't come back from the dead after a day or two or three or whatever. It just does not happen. But then he said, yeah, but Jesus was God and it was a miracle. I said, you are right. Jesus is God, and it was a miracle. And just like Jesus could rise again after three days from the dead, he could create everything in six days, just like he said. In John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, for him, by him, through him, all things were created. It was a miraculous act of God, and he did things just like he said. But again, the skeptic was deciding to take his own wisdom, deciding to go to God's word and tell God what he's willing to believe and what he's not willing to believe, which is very dangerous. Again, we need to trust God, and when we look at the science of it, you realize, wow, you can actually trust what it says. So we'll be getting into some of that in this particular talk. We're going to look very briefly here on the idea of, a, of the flood. What does the Bible say about the flood? Keeping in mind, for most of history, we didn't have science. <laughs> we just had God's Word. So do we believe that God wrote all this down knowing that people would actually believe it, but eventually we would have modern scientists to tell us, no, that never happened, God didn't mean any of that, and God himself is now relieved to, to realize that we can figure out that he didn't mean any of that, he really meant something completely different. Do we believe that, or do we believe that God is able to communicate in such a way that people throughout history could understand exactly what he meant? So, what does the Bible actually say about this particular flood? We'll look through the passage here, Genesis 6:17. And as we go through here, you look at key words that are highlighted to get the impression, is this just like a small minor event or is this like a major worldwide cataclysmic event? And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood, on, a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Then Genesis 7, 11 through 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. 
and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Then verses 17 through 24. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up uh, upon the face of the, earth, of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and that all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. 15 cubits upward, that's about 22 and a half feet, did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl and of the cattle and the beasts and every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life and all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping thing and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. Sounds pretty extensive. It does not sound like a little local, local minor flood there. So let's look at the, the local flood interpretation. And just so you know, you might be aware, the Christians who believe that God used the Big Bang as part of his creative acts, and, and many Christians accept that. There's got to be people here today that just figure, well, God used the Big Bang because he's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. And God can do whatever he wants. And he is all powerful but he can't lie. And it's not that he's not powerful enough to lie. <laughs> it violates his character. He can't lie. So he could have created things in any way he wanted to. It's more important, what did he tell us he did? But if you accept the Big Bang, they all oh, God used a Big Bang, it doesn't matter how he created or when, as long as we say he's a creator. Well, if we accept that, then you can't accept a global flood. Because if the earth was formed over millions and millions and millions of years of Earth history, which is what the Big Bang teaches, if we step all the way through it, which I won't do right now, then that means the layers in the Earth were formed over hundreds of millions of years of Earth history as God kind of used that process to form the Earth. Well, you can't then later have Adam and Eve and then 1,700 years after that have Noah and then have a global flood because a global flood would lay down sedimentary layers all over the planet again, but you've already got all that done. You've already got the Grand Canyon, you've got Mount Everest, all those features that they say are millions and millions of years old. You can't disrupt that, so you have to just have a little local flood that doesn't mess anything else up. So the Christians who believe in the Big Bang have to say, well, Noah's flood was just a local flood. So let's examine that idea. If it was just a local flood, why would Noah spend so much time building an ark? God could have said, hey, Noah, here's the number of a good realtor. Move, I'm going to flood this area. But he spent over 100 years building an ark because it was a global flood. Why build such a big ark? If it was just a local flood, he could have put a few local animals on it and been done. But he put all those animals on it because it was a global flood. Why put birds on the ark? If it was just a local flood, the birds would have flown away. They would have been fine. But no, you had to put birds on the ark because it was a global flood. Nowhere for them to exist during that year of the flood. Then it says all the high hills under all the heavens were covered. You can't cover all the high hills under all heaven in a local area. Water seeks its own level. It's impossible to do. It's only possible to cover all the high hills under the whole heaven with a global flood. And also, did God break his promise? God gave us the rainbow. He said, the rainbow is going to be my symbol that I won't do this again. We read that Genesis 9, 8 through 17 says, neither shall there be any more of a flood to destroy the earth. If it was just a local flood back then, then God lied because there have been thousands of local floods where hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives. So if it was a local flood, God lied to us because he said he'd never do that again. Local floods don't last 370 days. That's the length of the entire flood from beginning to end. Local floods don't last anywhere near that long. And it says the waters receded for 73 days. Here are the mountains of Ararat, where the ark landed. It didn't land on Mount Ararat. It landed in the mountains of Ararat. This is greater and lesser Mount Ararat. So the ark landed somewhere in there initially. And it took 73 years, 73 days for those waters to recede. And it's not going to happen in a local flood. So is there any evidence that there really was this global flood? There's tons of evidence, and I will fly through these examples. We have marine sea creature fossils on top of mountains. Here are sea creatures fossilized on top of Mount Everest. That's five and a half miles high. How in the world is that possible? Unless those mountains were lower in the past, 
covered with a global flood, sediments being buried on it, sea creatures, and then at the end of the flood, God says, Psalm 104, it caused the mountains to rise up even higher out of the water. That's how you can have marine fossils on top of mountains. But you can't do that with a local flood. It's evidence of a global flood because we see that all over. Then we have rapid burial of animals and plants. These sedimentary layers that we see in the earth, they are filled literally with billions and billions of fossils. What is a fossil? Well, fossils are made of a dead thing, and the only way you get a fossil is to bury it rapidly. If a cow dies in the field, animals will eat the meat and the bones will rot away. It won't fossilize, but if you buried it by a local landslide very quickly, it, the bones could be preserved or turned into fossils. But you've got to bury it rapidly. The fact that all these sedimentary layers all over the planet have billions and billions of fossils in them show us they were all laid down catastrophically all over the planet. You can only do that with a global flood. And then we have rapid or no erosion between these layers. These examples here of these little pancake layers straight across. This is evidence that these layers were laid down one after another after another, that there wasn't any time in between the layers for other things to happen, for erosion to happen, what we call bioturbation, animals burrowing up and down through those layers, soil developing, forests growing and all that. There's no evidence of any of that happening. Here's one example. We see this in the Grand Canyon, the two layers of Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale. You can see this razor sharp edge between those two layers. That supposedly, according to evolution, represents 10 million years of Earth history. Between the layers, where, where you see nothing, that's evidence of 10 million years of Earth history. There's nothing there at all. So let's talk about this problem. We've got some layers that are up on the screen. The secular scientists used to tell us that each layer was laid down slowly over millions and millions of years. So from bottom to top, you've got hundreds of millions of years of Earth history. Well, when they started you know, seeing all these fossils in these layers, that's a problem. Because the only way you get a fossil is to bury something rapidly. So now they pretty much agree, okay, yeah, those layers, they were laid down rapidly. But that destroys the hundreds of millions of years evidence they had. They can't give that up. They're not going to say, oh, I guess we were wrong. Maybe the Bible's right. It's not going to happen. So they were creative. They said, okay, each layer was laid down rapidly. But what happened is after one layer was laid down, it sat there for millions of years of Earth history, and then the next layer was laid down very rapidly, and then that sat there for millions of years of Earth history, and then the next layer, layer very rapidly. Well, let's think about that. Let's say that this layer here was laid down very rapidly because we got fossils in it, and then it sits there for millions of years of Earth history. What would we see if it sat there exposed to the elements for millions of years? Well, one thing you'd see is erosion in the top of that millions of years of Earth history, and then the next layer would come and bury that rapidly, so that builds up, and then that layer would sit there for millions of years, and you'd see more er erosion, sometimes very significant erosion, and then the next layer would come very rapidly and fill that in, and then that would sit there, and you'd see erosion on the top of that. So the layers we would see in the Earth would be like this, with stuff going up and down and erosion in between each of these layers. What do we actually see? Well, I showed you that example pancake, like razor edge lines between these layers. There's another example, the Grand Canyon. I'll talk about that more in just a second. Again, more layers all over the earth, these pancakes. There's no evidence of any time occurring between these layers. Then we talk about cross bedding. I'll skip some of the details. You'll, you can tell that these are kind of on an angle, the striations in the rock, because they were laid down on an angle. Um, the evidence shows that these layers were laid down in water. If they're at a certain angle, that's evidence they were laid down in a desert environment, like a sand dune. Secular scientists say that these things were laid down in a desert environment. So when we look at the Grand Canyon, the white stripe across there is Coconino sandstone. They call it the bathtub ring of the, uh, the Grand Canyon. So it's this ring that goes all the way across there. So here's the secular story. All the layers that are below that or laid down, they say, in a water environment. The uh, oceans kind of came across the, the continent and kind of sat there, and some things trickled out and formed those layers, and then an, another ocean came in, formed another layer and all that. But eventually, you get to the Coconino Sandstone, they say, that was formed in a desert environment. So the whole continent was lifted up out of the water, and a desert formed that layer, and then the whole thing dropped down again, and then the ocean came in to form the layers on top of that. 
That's crazy. There's no evidence that that ever happened. And even if you did push all those layers up, you'd see all the layers below that all cracking and shattered because you push an earth up. There's no evidence of that. The evidence is that those layers were also laid down in a flood. So we also have greatly folded rock layers. I don't know if you've ever tried to fold a rock before. <laughs> don't waste your time. Even if you were strong enough, the layers would just shatter. It's very brittle. But we see great folds in rock layers, and there's no evidence of any shattering. Because the layers were not laid down slowly over millions of years and then folded later, they were laid down catastrophically in a single event like a global flood. And as they were still soft, the plates were moving and it's getting folded up, and it subsequently hardens into solid rock after that. The little circle that's on the top there, there's just a little nub. You can barely see it in there. That's a fence with a person standing behind it. So it gives you a little bit of the scale of how big those are. I took this picture um, in the United Kingdom, uh, close to the uh, English Channel there. My wife and I were there two years ago, and I was there about two weeks ago. But it's kind of cool to see them in person. And there are examples like this all over the planet. Evidence of catastrophic deposition of these layers, showing you they couldn't have been laid down slowly over hundreds of millions of years. And the Grand Canyon that I mentioned, the canyon is 277 miles long, 10 miles wide on average, and about a mile deep. That's a huge canyon, a lot of dirt missing. Sometimes you do some yard work and you might get you know, five or six cubic yards of topsoil delivered. The canyon represents 5.4 trillion cubic yards of soil gone. <laughs> that represents a global event happening, not just the Colorado River. It's physically impossible for that river to have carved out that canyon for, for many, many reasons. I have to skip some of the details. But you're probably familiar with Bill Nye, the science guy. When he was debating Ken Ham, uh, he made this claim. He said, if this great flood drained through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent? How could we not have Grand Canyons everywhere if this water drained away in this extraordinarily short amount of time? So he's saying if there was really a worldwide catastrophic flood, we wouldn't just have a nice Grand Canyon here in the U.S. for us to enjoy. There'd be canyons all over the planet. Guess what? There are canyons all over the planet. Here's an example of one in the Himalayas in Nepal. This canyon happens to be larger than the Grand Canyon. Here's the basin of that canyon. It's 3.3 miles deep. That's three times as deep as the Grand Canyon and a little bit longer than the Grand Canyon. For scale purposes, we'll take a look at a map of the United States. That basin takes up the size of Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona put together. Here's a map of the Grand Canyon. Let's put the Grand Canyon on the United States map. That's the Grand Canyon compared to the basin size of this canyon in the Himalayas. The Grand Canyon is nothing compared to the other one. That's just one example. And then we have one in Nambia. We have another canyon in South Africa, another canyon in Tibet, another canyon in Australia, another canyon in Taiwan, very beautiful, one in Peru, and we have one in Romania. Then we have one in Mexico, and then we have more, and then we have even more. There's about 300 canyons around the planet, some of which, again, are larger than the Grand Canyon. So the reason why we have so many canyons is there was a worldwide flood. Tons of evidence for that. I already mentioned a Grand Canyon trip. If you weren't here for my earlier talk this morning, if you're interested, myself and Russ Miller do tours of the canyon, one day walking along the rim, looking down, the next day on the river looking up, giving many lectures along the way. Very easy to understand, but you will see firsthand evidence of Noah's flood, Genesis 6 through 8. It's not just a story in the Bible. It explains why we are seeing these layers all over the planet. It had to have been a worldwide flood, you know, justifying our belief in the authority of God's word. It can really be trusted. It's not a made up story. And it explains so many things. I didn't mention this morning, forgot. We have a special going on. If a church has 10 people to sign up, we will let your pastor go free. If you sign up 15 people, pastor goes free and a spouse half price. If 20 people sign up, both pastor and a spouse can go free because we want pastors to be able to go with their congregation because it is so faith affirming and so exciting. People get so fired up. 
They really get into reading the Bible and they're more confident in sharing the gospel message. Again, it's not about winning a debate about the global flood. It's about being confident in the gospel message because you know you can trust the Bible as a whole. You don't have to be embarrassed about the creation account or the story of the flood. Those things literally happen and there's a lot of evidence. So you can go about your day by confidently sharing the gospel message. So again, if you're interested, See us soon because the first trip filled up so fast. We started a second trip August 23rd through the 26th. So Grand Canyon cutaway, you've probably seen these diagrams before. If you take a look where the red line goes across here, the portion underneath seems a bit different than the layers on the top. The layers on the top are mostly like those pancakes going straight across, but the layers underneath, there's a lot going on there. Something happened in between there. They call it an un conformity. It does not conform. The two layers don't conform with each other because something major happened. That's the beginning of the flood. The flood came through and just ripped up rocks that were there and relayed layers down there and there's so much evidence of that. Uh, I live in Wisconsin and I live a couple hours from a place called Devil's Lake in the Wisconsin Dells area and it's just beautiful. You can go rock climbing. There's a beautiful lake there. But some of those rock formations, you can see this great unconformity. That line I was telling you about, that's the red line going across. So the bottom half of the screen there is the original creation rock. It's granite rock. That had to be part of the original creation. Everything above that is where the flood started and water coming through churned up solid granite rock and boulderized it. And water can do that through the process of cavitation and a bunch of other processes. So, so you can actually walk up to this Put your hand on it and you touch the original creation rocks and then see where the flood started. So much evidence for that. Here's one other scientist. I mentioned him giving you my background that I'm on the board of directors with Logos Research Associates. This is Dr. John Baumgartner, the PhD geophysicist who has built the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. Even the secular scientist uses his model. His model shows that when the plates of the earth start moving, when they have subduction, when one plate goes underneath another plate, it starts to go faster and faster because of heat differences and all that. His model shows that plates of the earth could be moving meters per second. Plates of the earth moving meters per second during the flood. You can imagine the upheavals that we would have with water coming over onto the continents, bringing all those you know, sea creatures and being fossilized in the middle of, of, of the continent and all that on top of mountains. So his model shows all that. So when I took him on tour, he came to visit, I showed him this and he said this was the best example of the great unconformity he's ever seen. He got really excited about it. So it's just kind of cool that when you go on the trip with us, we, we can actually show you the great unconformity and all these evidences for the worldwide flood. So again, we got the cutaway of the Grand Canyon and this little slot there. I'm going to put this cutaway where it fits there. That's for scale size, that's the Grand Canyon there. Now you notice the layers going off to the right, they start to kind of dip down. We'll follow them across the screen. They get lower and lower, but now you see other layers on top of them. I mentioned this morning the Grand Staircase. That's what this is called. They look like stair steps. These layers that exist here do not exist by the Grand Canyon. They've been washed away. Well, again, the Colorado River and the little bottom of that ditch did not wash away a mile and a half of layers above the canyon. It's physically impossible. It was a worldwide event. So we have physical evidence right there just to the north of the canyon of all these layers that used to be there but are gone now. Again, the river didn't do that. It was a worldwide event that washed across the continent. So again, those are the types of evidences that we cover on our trip. One other example of water doing something in a short period of time. We have the Burlingame Canyon in the state of Washington. Here's a picture of it. It's 1,500 feet long, 120 feet deep, and 120 feet wide. It's not as big as the Grand Canyon, but it's pretty big. This canyon was formed in six days. <laughs> they had rerouted some water to irrigate the area there, and one canal was there's too much water going through it, so they were trying to have the water go somewhere else and it got out of hand and it flowed through this area and in six days it carved out that whole thing. A little bit of water in six days did all that damage. Can you imagine what a worldwide event would do over the period of a year? You could easily have the Grand Canyon and you know, hundreds of other canyons across the globe because water does a tremendous amount of damage. It can cut through solid 
concrete and rock and rebar reinforced concrete. The Glen Canyon Dam uh, in the Grand, Grand Canyon area, that's what happened. They let some water go around the dam for a number of reasons and it just cut right through solid concrete and rebar and they had to quick shut it off because of the process called cavitation, which I'll skip for now because of time. One other example of something doing a lot of damage in a short period of time, Mount St. Helens. 1980, it erupted. We'll talk about exactly what happened here. Erupted in nine, for nine hours in 1980, uh, month of May. An earthquake registering 5.1 on the Richter scale triggered the initial landslide that led to the initial steam blast that came out the side. The initial steam blast went about 150 miles an hour and was equal to 20 million tons of TNT throwing up blocks the size of you know, cars and city blocks, you know, all this rock being thrown up into the air. Also, we have these details. 150 square miles of forest level were leveled in six minutes, just from the initial steam blast. That is enough lumber to build 640,000 three-bedroom homes in six minutes. <laughs> That's a lot of damage in a short period of time. Over the entire episode is equivalent to 400 million tons of TNT. That's 20,000 atomic bombs going off. It's like one bomb every second going off from Mount St. Helens. Then we have this. It produced a wave 860 feet high that scoured the land, it ripped up a lot of the timber and put it into Spirit Lake that was nearby there. Two years later, a mud flow going through that area carved out a miniature 140th scale Grand Canyon, solid rock, in a short period of time. The volcanoes that formed Yellowstone were probably 2,000 times as powerful as Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens was a relatively small volcano, but it did a lot of damage in a very short period of time. And during the flood, you'd have a lot of volcanoes going off, some on land, some in the oceans doing an awful lot of damage. Then over in the Yellowstone area, we have something called Specimen Ridge, where you've got all these layers here and all these trees going there. The secular interpretation is, look at all these layers. And you have multiple forests. So you had one layer at the bottom being laid down, and it was there a long time, and an entire forest grew there and lived there. And then that layer got buried over a long period of time, and then an entire another forest grew. And that, that eventually got buried, and then a whole nother forest grew, and then another layer. So obviously that's a lot of time from bottom to top. If that story was true, that would be a lot of time. What's interesting, cutting myself short a little bit, is when Mount St. Helens went off, it was like a mini laboratory showing us what can happen in a short period of time. And what formed was something pretty much just like this. We had layering. Uh, the, the timber that was scoured off the land for the, the wave that went up there and all the timber was floating around in Spirit Lake. You could almost walk across the lake on all these logs floating there. As the logs are floating there, the bark's being ripped off and slowly going down to the bottom of the lake and forming these peat layers. And then the, the trees that are floating there, they don't have their root systems, just kind of a stump there, but they become waterlogged and sometimes they float vertically in the water. Then they become so heavy they sink down and they kind of center themselves in whatever layer happens to be there at the time. Then later another one goes vertical and then that one comes down to whatever layer is there. We start to see these multiple layers of partial tree trunks without their root systems. That's what we see in Specimen Ridge. There are no root systems there. These trees were not growing there. They were growing somewhere else, catastrophically uprooted and rapidly redeposited here in a global event like the global flood. It wasn't multiple forests over hundreds, you know, thousands and millions of years. And Mount St. Helens was a little laboratory showing how this actually happens in a short period of time. So, starting to wind down here, taking the Bible seriously, John 5, 46 and 47, Jesus is speaking, he said, for if ye had believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus is saying, if we don't take Moses seriously, first five books of the Bible, why would we trust Jesus' words? Jesus referred to Moses. Jesus took that literally. He took it seriously. But even today, many Christians, well, I know that Genesis says this, but you know, we know better now. It can't really mean that six-day creation. It must mean a Big Bang. It must mean maybe even evolution, because they've proven that too. 
And I know the Genesis 6 or 8 says a worldwide flood, but yeah, secular geologists, they don't believe that. They say it's impossible. Where did all that water come from? Where did all that water go? How did Noah get all those animals in the dark? So that, that probably didn't happen either, and on and on and on. But Jesus said, you, you write that off, you might as well write the rest of it off. Why do we magically choose to believe in Jesus when we're admitting, yeah, maybe there's some problems in the rest of the Bible, but the Jesus stuff, that's pretty good. If I was a skeptic, I'd say, I'm just going to skip the Jesus stuff, too, because if you're admitting problems, there's probably problems with Jesus, too, and I don't really like it anyway. So we need to take God at his word from cover to cover. So I really wasn't here to try to teach you all these scientific details about the flood. I really wanted to draw your attention to the authority of God's word, that it can be trusted for everything. And the title here, This Changes Everything, think about this. When you look at the the geologic column. You can picture in your mind all the layers in the textbooks, the geologic column, and that's evidence of evolution, the simple life on the bottom and complex life on the top, and it evolved over hundreds of millions of years. There's only one place on the earth you can see the geologic column, and that's in the textbook. It doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. Oh yeah, we got layers, but not in that order from bottom to top. And the fossils that are in those layers, they don't show gradual evolution from simpler to more complex. They show an absolute explosion of complex life in one of the lowest layers, the Cambrian layer. They call it the Cambrian explosion. It's all these complex life forms that came out of nowhere, fully formed. And then in all the layers on top of that, there's no evidence that these things are really changing. That represents evidence of things getting buried where they were living when the flood came, not evolving over millions of years. So here's the point. If those layers in that geologic column don't re represent slow, gradual evolution over millions and millions of years, but they represent the judgment of God through a worldwide flood, that changes everything. The idea of evolution is just toast. It's done. The millions of years is just done. The Big Bang is done. So will the secular scientists give this up? Not a chance. Because it's their worldview. They are entrenched. This is a spiritual issue we're dealing with. It's not that they're not smart enough. They need a different starting point to look at those layers, to interpret them differently. That's why we need to approach this spiritually and take confidence in God's word as we're sharing the gospel message with them. Then the light bulb will come on and they'll say, wow, I never thought about that, about the layers. You're right, good point. It couldn't be hundreds of millions of years. It must have been rapid deposition. And wow, that's what your Bible says, right? And they get excited about it rather than going to church with us when we don't really believe all the Bible, but we're getting them to come to church and they have to pick and choose what they're going to believe and what not going to believe. That doesn't really make any sense at all. So I already talked about our resources on the table, so I'll skip through that. Just a reminder of the uh, live stream, free live streams that we do. The next one again is going to be March 29th. It's a Thursday night. Again, all you have to do is go to our website, thestartingpointproject.com. Again, you don't need to install anything or sign up or anything. You just pull up the website. You'll see a little video window, see me speak for about a half an hour, and then you can even submit a question by filling out one little field and hitting the button, and we do live Q&A. You can also see our past episodes that are archived on our website as well. And again, the Grand Canyon trip, see us at the table or go to our website for more details, but contact us soon if you're uh, interested in going to that at all. My last talk tomorrow is going to be entitled, Surprise, the Bible Explains That. Very often scientists discover things that are confusing to them. Doesn't make sense, but when you know scripture, it makes perfect sense. The Bible does explain these things. I'm gonna go through eight examples tomorrow, again, to strengthen your faith in God's word. Very, very exciting. Um, I appreciate you guys putting up with me talking a million miles an hour. James 1.19 says be slow to speak, but it doesn't say speak slow. <laughs> so I go fast, not to have you memorize things, but just to strengthen your faith in the authority of God's word. So I'll close in a quick word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we've had to look again, uh, once again, at the authority of your word, that it can be trusted from cover to cover. And I pray for each person here at the conference and those listening in live, that their faith would be greatly strengthened, not to go out and win arguments, but to uh, boldly share the gospel message with a lost and dying world. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.